So there is something to this movie. There is something to be said to this I movie. I love the image of you probably in a basement somewhere. <laughs> You're elbow deep in a bag of chips, giggling. Well, that was As me. you watch a low budget movie about monkeys shooting bald guys. Yeah, that was, that was me last Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the final episode of Go Ape podcast where we talk about all five of the original Planet of the Apes movies and today as I said earlier is the final one which means we are talking about battle for the Planet of the Apes. I am once again joined by my guest or I guess I'm your guest in this case. I'm Oliver the Ricketts, uh, internet menace, mm. um, societal sweetheart and I'm I'm so excited to talk about the worst apes movie. I know is it I think it's so fitting. Knowing you and I, our sense of humor, too. That <laughs> this is the one. This is the one where we actually get together. <laughs> I love a bad movie that is born of cynicism. I love just studios scrambling to make something work that just doesn't work. Yes. And I love especially studio bad... Not love, like, for entertainment, but I love to talk about... Because movie making is so fascinating. Um... It is so cool that we can actually see 20th Century Fox panic because they made a good movie. Yes. And backtrack so hard that they make a bad movie. It's very similar to what happened with Star Wars, where Disney put out The Last Jedi. Yeah. And you know what? It was too real for people. I'll be the one to say it. And so they panicked. And then they tried to make a movie that everybody would like. And in doing so... Nobody liked that. They made something nobody will like. And I think that's kind of what happened here. It is 100% what happened here. The backlash that the studio got with parents and the executives with Conquest being too dark. I mean, the fact that it was rated PG was huge. Yeah. That, especially back then, that was huge. And I still find it baffling that the filmmakers and the writers were like, no, this is going to be a G movie. <laughs> the race riot at the end really screams G. <laughs> they did too good of a job. Despite the film still being making a good chunk of money, especially with its small budget, it had the wrong audience. Even though my mentality is it doesn't matter what audience is watching your movie money so long as you're watching money. your movie. Yeah. It is like a weird studio thing. So... Well, uh, I, time out for a second, because I really want to emphasize this too. 20th Century Fox was on the verge of bankruptcy. So I, why would they care if who is who watching, watching their movie? And these movies were already born from that, well, from that need of making money. That is strange, because what they did with apes every single time was they're like, it's guaranteed money. Yeah. Um, let's downscale the budget. Always. And every time. People will still come out and see this. Yes. Um, and they did. So why... Why? Especially for this one. I mean, they made this for about six dollars. Um, it had it had a <laughs> little. I think it had a little bit of the same budget. I think it had the same budget as Conquest, if not a little more. Okay. It might have had a little bit more, but like, well, and I mean peanuts more. When you watch this versus Conquest, it is night and day. It is night and day, and it all comes down to the studio being like, "No, this needs to be for kids." They fired Paul Dane. Which is a who's, travesty. Who was the main writer of the previous three, all the sequels. Mm. He's been the main writer. And it is a travesty because, well, his health was really declining at this time, too. Sure. He was, he was way overworked. He was writing scripts left and right. He was writing uh, music lyrics left and right. He was doing all sorts, writing books. He was all over the place. And... He was his health was really declining. I love the idea of the guy writing music lyrics like be who should we get for our radio hit? How about the guy who did monkey movie? Dane got fired because he all right from the get go of the ending of Con Conquest. He was like, I'm pretty sure they're going to make another one. Yeah. So this one's probably going to be the last one. That seemed to be the overall consensus amongst everybody. Right. Is that this was going to be the final apes movie. It had gotten to the point where they're like the, the returns aren't going to go up anymore. They're just going to keep going down. Therefore, the budget needs to keep going down. Therefore, we're going to have to give people less of what they want, which are the talking monkeys. And we don't want that. And it was even and, advertised as the final chapter. And if you see Conquest, it feels like the end. It's We talked about this last week. It's the logical conclusion. When we know that this world ends mm -hmm. with a giant bomb going off. Yeah. 
a movie about the cycle of violence and it not mattering who's at the wheel. Yeah. That's the end. Yeah. You know, this is almost to me, and I've used this term, I actually just used this term on um, the Film Fan Club show when we talked about Furiosa. Furiosa, and I think this movie too, it feels like movie DLC. This almost, it could be a TV series, man. Well, Battle, you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, because, be, and, and that's that's just it too, is is it's like Paul Dane gets gets fired. And what they do is they hire on a, a husband-wife duo mm-hmm. that was making rounds in Hollywood at the time. And it wasn't like they were making crap. Right. They were making decent stuff. And I mentioned to you the reason why they got this job was because they made the Omega Man with Charlton Heston. Right. Uh, which is an adaptation of I Am Legend. It's a very 70s movie. It's very goofy because it's a 70s movie. Sure, yeah, yeah. And it's Charlton Heston running around with a Browning automatic rifle going absolutely crazy. And it's awesome. Huge hit. Right. Huge hit. So they brought them on to work on this. And they eagerly accepted. Right. Well, of course. it's. I mean, it, it was a huge franchise. Yeah. But what a difference a writer can make. Because what Paul Dane's original vision of this was going to be was very much in, in line with what the original ending to Conquest was. Caesar was going to essentially be like Nero. Mm-hmm. And he was basing Caesar off of Nero in Rome. Yeah. Where he's kind of gone crazy. Right. He has multiple wives. Mm-hmm. And the big thing that they were really going to set up is that all the humans, none of them could talk because he had their vocal cords removed. That is dark. Well, I can see how that's not made for kids. Yes. I, I'm not going to say it was any darker than, it would have been darker than what Conquest ended up being. Mm-hmm. Just darker in a different way. Because what they were going to do was they were going to say, yes, history is just going to repeat itself. There's no changing here. Which the fingerprints of that are still, they're, they're it, still, they're still in this movie. There. Yeah. Uh, and and I agree. It's it's a big thing about a shift in in writers because the the message of this is still humans and apes are just as bad as each other depending on the circumstance. Right. To me, it's fascinating because it does seem that that is somebody in the new series mm-hmm. went and looked at these and said, "What are they trying to do?" Rise of the Planet of the Apes is such a loose adaptation of Conquest. Yes. In yep. in many ways, you have Caesar rise up. Ape superiority, let's go. What happens in Dawn? He learns that apes can be just as bad as humans, and he finds a human being who he feels is compassionate and and a good person. Uh, Dawn and War kind of feel like a loose adaptation of battle. Yeah. Because there's elements in in battle that appear in both of them, specifically battle. Right. So they changed, they, they had to lighten it up. Arthur P. Jacobs is told, the main producer, he's told by, um, who was also very sick at this Mm. time. Arthur P. Jacobs was exhausted and tired, not going to put up a fight. He he said, okay, we got to make this lighter. So they complete, they took Paul Dane's outline, Uh the writers, and just lightened the tone. Right. They made Caesar a much softer character, which again fits more in line with the ending that we got in the theatrical cut of the previous film. They decided to, instead of setting it in like a wasteland, they decided to set it in a Garden of Eden. That's that's how they worded it. A Garden of Eden. And lawmakers reading a story to the kids. Start, and he's John Huston, the legendary John Huston in ape makeup. It's great. Uh, I live by several thrift stores, which mm-hmm. are full of ape stuff because they're they're specifically like vintage type mm-hmm. stores. If you go there, there is usually an ape toy somewhere, and it is usually lawmaker yeah. from this movie. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Because the one that I've seen the most is either Urko from the TV series, yeah. who's the gorilla general, or Ursus. Yeah. I see a lot of Ursus. A lot of Ursus. When this movie was also coming out, too, they were also making deals with television. Mm-hmm. Because what would come out of this would be the Planet of the Apes television series, which only ran for 24 episodes. But what I do know that came out of this is Go Ape came out of this. Because when this movie was, as this movie was being released in theaters, it was almost simultaneously being released on television Mm -hmm. with all five films being played. (laughs) That's how the television show, I think, got greenlit was because of how successful these movies were playing on television. Yeah, people are now willing to watch apes on TV. Yeah. And 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 it was huge. It was huge. They were being exported all over the world. Everyone was going ape. Well, and I'll I'll also say, as much as I dislike this movie, Mm -hmm. I've made a point of talking about I love a marketing blitz. I mm-hmm. love movie merchandising that is not chuggy. Like, I love I love when movie marketing and movie merchandising add to the fun. And that's what happened here. Yeah. In a lot of ways, because they made a kid's movie, and the movie itself is not for me. 
Mm -hmm. Right. But it's the same way as when Spider-Man popped back up in the MCU. And it's like suddenly there were Spider-Man toys and there was Spider-Man stuff. And the current Spider-Man, not for me. Right? Right. But I love Mm Spider-Man and I love seeing it places. Makes sense. Yeah. One, they didn't use the same film process as before. We talked about Tadeo 35 a bit. So the movie looks a little less colorful right. than the last movie, which is ironic because there's so much lack of color in the previous right. one. And, and this is the vibrant Green battle one. Yeah. war movie. Yeah. I cannot believe that this is basically the same crew right. from the previous movie. It is night and day different <laughs> in terms of the quality. This I, Here's how I like to word, the, at least visually, and even pr- how it's presented. This movie legit feels like it is just a higher end made for TV movie from that era. I was literally just going to say that. And as it's being played on TV, almost as it's coming out, Mm -hmm. do you think there's a consensus as you're making it that this is a made for TV movie? It could have been. It very well, we don't know. Right. We don't know because Jay Lee Thompson doesn't really like to talk about this movie very much. He'll sure. talk he'll talk on end about Conquest. I think Jay Lee Thompson does have something to be proud of with this film. I really do. And that's the fact that he was ma- able to make it sure. as big as it was. Right. With such a small budget. And what's what's interesting is that you watch the battle sequence in this movie, and that's to me where the budget really fails the film. Right. Is the battle scene. As an editor, I can see they used every trick in the book right. to make it look bigger right. than what it really is, including using the same treehouse that explodes, <laughs> shooting it from like five different angles, yep. and then just cutting it into different places to make it look like more tree houses are exploding. Sure. I think if there's anything that you can take away from this movie, it is the fact that it, it looks as competent as it does, which is by far the least competent out of all the Apes movies. But when you learn about the behind the scenes story, mm-hmm. the total lack of care from 20th Century Fox in terms of putting money into the project and just how low the budget was for the film, I go, I get it. Well, and and then things like the school bus mm-hmm. make a little bit more sense. Yes. It's certainly still big. <laughs> you know. Big, you know, in, yeah. in air quotes. I, I'll be honest, I fucking loved this movie as a kid. And, and that I totally get. I think... There's a lot of things like blockbusters that come out where mm-hmm. it's like, as an adult, this doesn't work for me. I was Jurassic World's Fallen Kingdom it was a big one for me. This movie was not uh, something that I fuck with in mm-hmm. any kind of way. But if I was five in a movie oh, about yeah. dinosaurs taking over New York City at the end, yeah, it would have blown my mind. Watching this as an adult, I'm losing a couple brain cells. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watching this when I'm six. The monkeys have guns. Do you not understand? I don't I don't think you guys know how much I love this movie almost solely because I'm getting to see all these monkeys running around with World War II, Korean War, of and Vietnam era guns. And I'm like, this is awesome. Shooting up a school bus full of mutants <laughs> with a M1928 Thompson submachine gun. I'm like, this is awesome. Seeing gorillas charge at the at the mutants carrying Browning automatic rifles, M1 carbines, and the old M16s from the Vietnam War era. I'm like, oh. in, in a lot of ways, it's like <laughs> it's like when you watch Temple of Doom as a kid. Yeah. And then when you become an adult, yeah, it's like, yeah. well, Raiders and Last Crusade are so much more intelligent. But I love, I still love Temple of Doom. Oh, because, oh because of I ha- I just Whenever I watch it, I still get that child sense of wonder. Of course. Watching the film. So there is something to this movie. There is something to be said to this I movie. I love the image of you... Probably in a basement somewhere. <laughs> You're elbow deep in a bag of chips, giggling. Well, that was as me. you watch a low budget movie about monkeys shooting bald guys. Yeah, that was that was me last Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> My notes for this. I have a lot of notes for this movie in terms of the story and how many holes are in it and all the problems that are in it. But the biggest one, it all comes down to budget and wow, what a difference a writing team. Yeah. Made. And we can go past it being made for kids mm-hmm. because I'm not here to be a Grinch. I'm not here to be like, nothing mm. should be made for children. You're talking to the guy that fucking loves Godzilla. Yeah. And I'm like, look, at, especially well, Showa era. I'm like, yeah. Again, <laughs> one of the other big things I talk about with movies is like, mm-hmm. there's nothing wrong with enjoying this movie or this movie even mm-hmm. having been made for kids inherently. Right. I do take issue with some of the story beats here That's, that were made yes. almost cynically, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, the main one being the character from Conquest, 
who is Caesar's, we'll say associate. Yeah. McDonald. When you, when you can't get that actor back, mm -hmm. the move is not to make it his brother. Yes. The move is either recast or write him out. Personally, I would have gone for a recast. Because Caesar at least has history with that character. Yes. When you make it his brother, and for those who don't know, the movie features that McDonald's brother. McDonald's. Um, Burger King. Burger King. Yeah. <laughs> it's his brother in this film because the, that actor was not available. Yep. And I think you lose... If, if this is McDonald in the movie, I think you gain a lot more subtext here because you have two characters who are have a history, like a profound history with each other in a violent situation, and their history pertains a lot to violence between their races. Yes, exactly. And and that was actually one of my one of my first notes here was the, the casting of uh, having McDonald be his brother. That was a genuine mistake, and it would have made more sense to conti a continuation of their character, mm -hmm. too. And that it would be interesting that McDonald is the voice of reason. What character do we have in there? What's his name? Winston? Or Watson, Paul Williams plays a plays a an orangutan in this movie, mm -hmm. who's always saying this long winded dialogue for no reason at all. It's like the writers thought that they were trying to sound intelligent, and it yeah. just comes off as long winded stupidity. Where I'm just sitting there like, if Paul Dane wrote this, it well, would have been it would have been a lot better. Which ultimately <laughs> was that was always the risk behind these movies was that it was going to start looking and feeling dumb because it was people right. in monkey suits. Apparently, the writers were inspired by the story of Cain and Abel. So they wanted to do the story of the first ape to kill ape. Which is, is part of the movie that is works. Is part of the movie that works, yes. Yeah. I, I agree completely. When, so that, to me, has a lot of the eeriness of Beneath. Yeah. When, when they start chanting, ape killed ape. Yeah. Right? That's also the only part of the score that works for me. I, think I was going to note that, so too. The score so weak. It, it is. The other, I like the main title music. Yeah, because I love like to me that sets up like we're going to have a fight. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, this is like a rousing score, and then it suddenly gets like really whimsical almost yeah. throughout the entire for the rest of the film, until that scene. Right. The the music there is good, and you have that mixing with the ape has killed ape. Yeah. That chanting. Yep. There is a director's cut, an extended cut to this movie. Not a director's cut, an extended cut to this movie that I have on my Blu-ray. Uh huh. And the big difference. Is there's a couple of added scenes. There's no violence added back into the movie or anything. There's just a couple of added scenes to really establish that these mutants are the mutants from beneath. One, a character named Mendez, yep. who is also the name of the head guy. From right, beneath. right, right. And also, they blatantly establish that they have the Alpha and Omega bomb, and that <laughs> yes, should yes, and and that should Culp, who is the leader in this. Should he fail, who is, is from the previous film. Mm -hmm. Culp, Culp was the head of ape security from the previous film, and he's still alive. And, now and he's received an, a promotion. But he orders that woman, if I don't come back and if this attack fails, blow up the bomb. Wild. And that's very dark for this movie. And that's very dark for the movie, but in, in the theatrical cut, none of that's in there. Right. And the scene at the end where Mendez goes, what are you doing? Don't mm. blow up the bomb. You're going to kill everyone. Culp was a fucking idiot. <laughs> what are you doing? And he talks her down from, from, from blowing up the bomb. Right. And so it hints in the director's cut that these mutants are not going to be the same mutants anymore that we saw in... There's been some kind of change. There's been a change. And the same with the apes. Right. Right. The, the ending. And even we have that the ending of the shot where, where the apes are all kind of... They're still kind of fighting here and there, mm. but like they're all sitting together being taught by the lawgiver and stuff like that. And I'm like, there's there's hints at this. And that's that's what they wanted to get across. But Ross. to me, I I hate that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I hate I, the idea that this movie is not cynical. Yeah. Um, this movie is the most, by far, the most optimistic out of all of them, purposefully so. Right. But to me, that that is disappointing because the best thing about Conquest and the best thing about Beneath... And really, when you boil it down, the best thing about Planet of the Apes is that, like, mean ending that they are mm -hmm. so good at, yes. you know? Because even what yeah. made us fall in love with apes is Heston seeing the Statue of Liberty. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't get meaner than that. Right. It, uh, there is something that I do like that's established very early on in this movie. You see that the humans have become basically slaves to the apes. Mm -hmm. And there's this one scene where you see, in the very opening of the movie, you see that a wheel has been broken. And all these guys are trying to lift that thing. And then comes General Aldo. Yep. 
and he just does it himself. <laughs> I like that because right. it to me it establishes yes they are different from us. Gorillas are insanely strong for no reason at all. So we're chimps. Mm. Yes, they are. We need to be afraid of them. We or we need to watch out for them, especially for somebody like Aldo, who is just running around on a horse, calling himself General. Yeah, General Aldo. It, it total and right from the get go, you get a total change in visuals. Mm. It almost sounds like a muted color palette, despite the fact that it should have been vibrantly green. Right, because this is a Garden of Eden. Well, and that is such a strange thing to me because if you're gonna be lighter, you're going to be a kids movie. Then be that. Yeah, you know, commit. You can tell that there's like hardly any lighting, right? Because they they had they didn't really have much of a choice. And again, that whole TV movie comes to vibe, or comes to mind because. If you look at like how 70s television shows were being shot, mm -hmm. identical. Yeah. I just completely identical. The only difference being that this was shot with anamorphic widescreen while those right. are, are shot with just regular spherical lenses. But the same theory of filmmaking is happening. The same yeah. the same basic practices are yeah. going on in battle. And I'm like, already something's off. Yeah. This is you the know? rifleman. Yeah. Caesar's first scene. I feel like it was a mistake making his first scene with him talking to those two orangutans, and yep. then he got to jump out of the way of, of Aldo right, right through with his with his guerrilla army, his guerrilla cavalry. Actually, <laughs> I should say, he has to get pushed out of the way. To me, it would have been far more effective if his first scene is when the teacher is getting chased. Which I actually genuinely like the the mm -hmm. school scene. Right, him teaching the apes how to write. Yes, and and how to read. I'm fascinated with the progression of the ape society. Which I can't believe it's advanced this well, far. Well, that, that's the other question. When the hell does this take place? Yeah, I, I think it takes place at like, tw like maybe 20 years. So the official timeline, because I looked it up. I was actually okay, you, curious. you actually looked it up. I've never seen 15 the years on the official it timeline. Was 15. Okay, so I wasn't totally wrong. That makes no sense. No. The fact that they are this advanced, they have all of these new outfits. I'm like, this is, this is where the new films blow the old films out of yep. the water is the natural progression we see of the apes. Right. While in this, you just got to swallow the pill that they just evolutionary jumped thousands of years in 15. Yeah. We've moved 15 years forward. Mm -hmm. The whole landscape has changed. The apes are as fluent as they were in the first movie. As the first movie. You yeah. would think that this movie took place after the first film, mm -hmm. before the second film. And I want to also confirm that I don't know if that was also the case in Paul Dane's original script. Right. I really don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if it was, just sure. because of the level of we don't care about continuity too much. Right. But especially back then. Had that been Caesar's first scene, where the teacher is running to Caesar, basically yelling sanctuary, yeah. and Aldo is about to kill him, and suddenly you see Caesar appear, stop. And Caesar appears. Yep. To me, that would have been such a, a, a way better first scene for that man because it establishes he's the leader. He's the one that the all the apes are looking up to for, for guidance. And I just, I'm like, why would you waste, have his first scene of him just casually walking? And they're talking about nonsense. It, in that in that sequence where he's talking with Watson, I think his name is Watson. A nothing but, scene gets exchanged for something really yeah. palpable. And I'm like, it is a, it's, we keep talking about fucking Star Wars. It's the same mistake that is made in Rogue One. Vader shows up a few times to tell some jokes, right? But then at the end, he's a badass and he walks through. Imagine how, and I'm not, it's not the same thing as Vader's not the main character. Right. Right. But imagine how much more effective that moment is if you have not seen Vader for the entire movie. That the first time you see him is he cracks that lightsaber in the dark rather than try not to choke on your ambitions, General. Why does he know puns? Yeah. There is something in this film that I genuinely like. Genuinely like. Is I like the makeup on Caesar. Because he no longer looks like the youthful Caesar from the sure. previous movie. He's got more wrinkles on his face. He looks older. And at the same time, he also seems to be a more wiser character. Because of his age. He's got some mileage on him yeah. now. And I will say, as a sidebar, the makeup in this movie, I think, is the best. Uh, I think there's it's, a it's lot decent. of improvement in the makeup here, there's much less use of masks. Yes, if much you notice less. that. Yes, I guess that's technology and like understanding 
getting further and yeah. not the budget. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure the reason. It, it is very true. There is much less pullover masks yep. in this movie than there was in Conquest. And it is a little over the top to see him watering plants <laughs> and everything, talking talking about about whimsical things and how he's a peaceful man. Who knew that Ape Che Guevara was also a gardener? Was also a gardener. Well, uh, big uh, horticulturist. Yeah, yeah, we Caesar says something interesting and he says to McDonald, mm. "We are not your masters." And then McDonald immediately goes, we are not your equals. And I think that's a good exchange. Like, that was a little bit there where I'm like, that's got to be something for Paul Dane. Yeah, that's got to be left over. straight from Paul Dane is, is Caesar being like, we're not your masters. We, and, 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 him, and him being like, we do not own slaves. We do not do this. Right. We are apes. We are better than humans. Which in itself makes it go, therefore, we're not equals. Yeah, because you're still better than us. Yes. That's so reminiscent of the end of the last, the last movie. film. Yeah. And, and, and again, Do you think apes will be better? Slightly. Slightly. You yeah. Know. And which is, I think is a great line too. Right. It's like, it's so clear that this Caesar is not the Caesar from the unrated versions, the ending of the unrated version of the previous film. This is blatantly going, the theatrical version of the film is what's canon. Which if we go with that Caesar from the ending of the theatrical cut, it makes sense why this yes, Caesar of would be a lot more lighthearted. Because and Caesar more... had a stroke at the end of that movie and suddenly believed a whole different <laughs> host of things. I have an interesting note here. Lisa is not Zira. There's a scene where he's where they're talking to each other, where Caesar and and Zira, uh, you see Caesar, Caesar and Lisa are talking to each other. Yeah. And I'm like, I can tell they're trying to do a Cornelius and Zira, and it's not working. Well, that was a doomed idea from the start. Yeah. Because Caesar and Cornelius are not that similar. No. You know. No. They well, they are and they aren't, and that's why I think it works so good. Right. Is he has elements of Cornelius in him. Sure. But he's a lot more violent. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. Cornelius yeah. is a gentle ape, and yeah. that is the part of him that leans into, that's a loving husband. Yes. You know? Yeah. I don't see Caesar as that. No. It feels kind of forced, and I don't feel the chemistry between the two of them. Sure. That I even saw in the previous film. In the previous film, what I liked about it is that they didn't have any dialogue together. It was right. all it was all the visuals. She's a scaled-back character yeah. almost in that yeah. previous and, one. And I love how the ending of the unrated version... Lisa becomes horrified of Caesar because of, because of how violent it's gotten. It's not like they're in love in that version. Sure. He just has a connection with her because they were forced to, to mate. Right. And therefore he kind of has like a care well, for her. Well, to me, that is her more, that's more of a grief connection than yeah. anything else. Yeah. Two people go through something very similar that are, that's traumatic. Mm-hmm. You're bonded to that person. That doesn't mean that you're in love and you're soulmates. Right. You know? And, and 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 it is a good scene, like like when she's been beaten in a control and suddenly Caesar comes in, he's all angry and violent. But yet when he sees her, he makes sure to go up to her and essentially go, Are you all right? Right. And does it very gently too. And I'm like, that's a night that kind of feels like Cornelius there. Mm. It just doesn't work in this because they they just don't have chemistry that that Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter had. Sure, there's it's just not there, right? And I'm like, ah, you can't do that. That being said, I think the scenes with Caesar and his son are quite touching. Yes, um, and I think perhaps that comes down to Roddy McDowell having mm-hmm. played an ape father and an ape son already. Yeah, old hat to him. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and, but it does it does work. And I think it would have worked even better if Caesar was more of that violent yes. version before. If all of a sudden he, in every scene that is with his son, he's suddenly really gentle, really kind, and very loving. Well, it, it comes down to a desire for, I, I want Caesar to be more complicated yeah. than he is in yeah. this movie. And and I guess that's me wanting the script to be more complicated because Caesar's our main character. Mm-hmm. But Caesar in Conquest is a really complicated character. Um, <laughs> Very with, with a lot of is, yeah. different sides to him in here, he is reduced to much less than that. And that almost like that, that would have added a whole nother layer to him where he can be a peaceful ape if he's a father and, and something else is at stake here. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. Virgil was that monkey's name. They rang a name, not mm-hmm. Watson, Virgil. 
Dialogue not written by Paul Dane, and it shows in the scene where Caesar and party get their guns. <laughs> it is the most needlessly long-winded sequence in that film. And for the record, for context, they're trying to get these guns because Caesar actually has an interesting thing to his character. He wants to know who the hell his parents were. Right. He's he's heard of them from Armando. Right. He still clearly loves and has affection for. But he doesn't know them. He doesn't know them. Right. And I like that idea of, do you want to know what happened? We Because he's he's so concerned about, and this I think is genuine. He's like, what the hell's going to happen in the future? I It's almost like, I wish I had my parents here to kind of guide me. Sure. Or point me in a, in a right direction. And McDonald's like, well, we have all of their recordings from Dr. Hasline in one of the archives. We can go see if it's still there. And right. I like that idea. Oh, absolutely. And, and especially, I like the idea that that is something that keeps coming back. Yes, you know, I do too. Um, because in Conquest, that was a problem. Yeah. Um, and now here it is again. And even in Escape, those recordings are, are the death of them. Yes, it leads to all the decisions that happen in Conquest is because of those yep. recordings, and I like that they're coming back here. But it's just interrupted by that scene where they're getting their guns, and there's that old orangutan who's like, you put me in charge of the, <laughs> of, of the arsenal, and I'm like, God fucking damn. Well, he's a big piece of 70s cheese. Yes, you know. and it's clearly done for comedic effect, sure. too. It's hard, it's hard to explain how it doesn't work. It's just such a tonal whiplash. Right. Between this and the previous film. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, it doesn't, doesn't go well together. Now, in the journey toward the city, mm -hmm. which is different to be New York, but we don't really know because it wasn't really named. The city wasn't really named. Do we think that it's not New York because they considered that to be too dark? It might have been. Do you, because we know that the apocalypse hits New York City. Yeah, it might have it might have been. I don't I don't I, I don't really think so. Mm -hmm. I just think they just went with generic. Okay. Word. And just and just went with universally that. uh accessible. Right, right. But what I I I have to question this. This they're doing this journey towards the city, and I noticed that they brought no food, no shelter. And no water for a three-day journey into a desert wasteland. They have fur. They're going to come out just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Why I bring that up is it's such a big point in the original Planet of the Apes movie when they do the big escape. Right. They're like, we got to bring water. We got to bring food. We got to do all this because it's We're a trying to make desert it across the desert. wasteland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, these guys, eh. Detail, eh. shmeat tails. <laughs> this is this is the most Adam note I think I could possibly take. There's some good split focus diopter shots in this film. <laughs> Particularly in the mutant underground. Yep. There's several shots in that movie where Culp will be in the foreground or a character will be in the foreground and stuff's going on in the background that's also in focus. It's, right. They've split the focus. It's a split focus diopter shot. Yep. And I'm like, it would work really good in an underground base like this where everything's really off kilter and slanted and yeah. broken. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that's a good way of making it seem uneasy without really <laughs> making the it uneasy. The best Adam Noyce filmmaking note. The beginning of the mutants, Mendez, we've already kind of established them that these are supposed to be the mutants from beneath. This is the origins of them. I love the fact that this entire movie happens because Culp is bored. <laughs> We haven't had anything interesting. We haven't had go anything. In a while. It literally is, opens with him being like, oh, "We're just moving debris again." I'm just so bored. I'm so bored. Apes. We need to kill them. Kill. Shoot. <laughs> and I love how literally everyone is like, "Culp, don't do this. <laughs> we are sick. We are tired. We are old people. We are. We are. We are suffering from radiation." Don't sickness. you see how boring that is? <laughs> Why do you want to go on a, on the attack with the apes? Because I'm bored. I, nothing interesting has happened in a while. <laughs> we go back to like, would you love this movie as a five-year-old? And the five-year-old to me would be like, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Caesar's shock. I think this is also very good. Caesar's anger when he realizes it was the apes who destroyed the planet in 3955. Yep. Not the humans. Yeah. Which is, that's a big piece of his character because... He truly believes that apes are superior. Better. Yes. I just wish this movie was more about that idea. Yes. You know? Yes, 100%. If the movie was more about that idea, I think it would be a much, I'm not saying a great film, but a much better film, a more rounded, solid movie. There's hints of that greatness throughout this that makes me go, yes, this is part of the Planet of the Apes franchise, but it's too little. Yeah, and, and it just, 
that's almost like why I wish that this was a TV series because it could be a show that had moments of greatness and then fun episodes, mm -hmm. you know? And something, a TV show almost feels more optional if you're a completionist watching movies. Because then you get to Conquest, it's like, well, that's the end. And then there's also this show mm -hmm. that I, you know, and I know that they did a TV show afterwards. I've never been compelled to watch it, but I might have been compelled to watch an ape show with those themes in it, even if it was mostly just fun. Right. That's kind of the show. Yeah. The Apes television series. That was kind of that in a nutshell. There is some creepy imagery down in the down in the sewer systems that For they're sure. walking through. Like there's one in particular that I genuinely go, ugh. It's when Caesar and his party, they're walking through the hallways and you just see them lined with sick, <laughs> dying people. I love an apocalypse film that has moved sick people into the gutter. I yeah. always think about Cloverfield. Yeah. Um, when they're walking through, they have to walk through the sewers of New York to get to the hospital. Right. How fucking gross, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? But I thought that the images of that were really creepy. Like, some of them are reaching out to them, like they're reaching out for help. Yeah. And they can't give it. And, like, they've got these burns all over their faces and stuff like that. I'm like, again, there's some hints of greatness here. We like it. Yeah, I like that. Violence, we like it. And then you see the mutant army. Which is the funniest, most pathetic thing I have ever seen I, in a movie. I love the mutants, man. <laughs> I, I, they're so my sensibility. I love just a big stupid science fiction concept, especially right. one in an old movie that doesn't work. Uh, it's <laughs> They have a bus. They have a broken down Jeep with broken glass in it with an artillery piece welded onto it. And that's it. They're traveling on foot. Everyone else is traveling they on got, foot. They got a little uh, redneck vibe going on they here. They do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, like mad. And they're wearing all black, wool black, walking <laughs> through a desert. They're just hobbling along. So many are falling over dead because of the heat. And I'm like, this is the most pathetic looking thing I have ever fucking seen in my life. They're, in hor they're a horrifying army with cerebral powers, Adam. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. Don't Oliver. you understand? <laughs> these are the guys who end it all. <laughs> <laughs> they, because they try to present these guys as intimidating to the apes. Sure. And I'm like, no, the apes are going to kick these guys' ass it's, when they show up. It's a monkey versus a bald guy. Yeah. It's a... <laughs> yeah. It's uh... <laughs> It's, it just doesn't, it does not work. There is a scene that's in between this that does, I think, work. And it's Aldo getting really pissed at Caesar because Caesar's gone. And Aldo sees an opportunity to seize power. Yeah. And he gets all of his guerrilla cavalry together. And, and he's saying the most Cornelius, Caesar's son, mm -hmm. overhears this because his pet squirrel got loose. And Aldo kills him. Yeah. Aldo, Aldo kills Cornelius. And I genuinely, I like the concept of that. Right. To keep his secret, he's willing to break the number one law of ape. Ape kill ape. Ape shall not kill ape, therefore, yep. but he had to kill an ape. And again, this kind of goes back to every scene with Caesar and his son. Caesar mourning his son is actually quite good. Mm -hmm. I love how all the apes have also have also gathered around Caesar's house, waiting to hear the news as, as Cornelius yeah, Caesar's died. out here sitting shiva. Yeah. <laughs> The scene reminded me of like sequences where like a monarch in like old Europe, their son was dying or like the heir was dying and like how all the people would kind of like gather around the well, palace to hear the news. Did, did the prince die? It's funny not to run back to communism, uh, but see if Caesar is Che Guevara, uh, this is very reminiscent of Castro's final salute in Cuba. Yeah. Um, all the people coming out. I've actually been in that parking lot um, mm. literally a parking lot just to see, is he dead? What's going on? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, very similar to what you're describing, where it's the, the authority figure has died. All the people are here yeah. to see. And, and I also love how devastated Caesar is yeah. by the loss of his son. And I love how almost catatonic Lisa gets. Like, even all, like, all the explosions are going on mm -hmm. all around the, the treehouse and everything. I like how she's just stunned sitting there watching over her dead son. This could be a very intelligent, very poignant movie. Yes. <laughs> and that's what's frustrating, it, too. Right. It, again, if you want to be a kid's movie, there's nothing wrong with that. But then be a kid's movie, you know? Right. Or figure out a more intelligent way to handle these themes within a kid's movie so that we don't feel cheated that it could have been something greater. Yes. Yes. 
And then, and then the, that leads to Aldo taking power. And I genuinely like this scene where the humans get brought to the council meeting. Mm. And that enrages several of the apes who are like, they should not be here. No humans allowed here. And I love the moment where Caesar, uh, where Aldo comes back and says, my men have been killed by the mutants. Mm. We're about to be invaded. So suddenly he seems right Right. And everything that he said, so apes start siding with him because Caesar's gone. We need we need a leader, mm. and I love the moment where where Virgil goes, "You are not Caesar," and Aldo sits down in Caesar's chair and says, "Caesar is not here." Yeah. I like that. Right. Again, hints of greatness. Where I'm like, if this was written by Paul Dane, if this had a more competent writing team behind it and they weren't too afraid of being dark that would have been an excellent coup scene sure caesar is not here i am it also sort of twists the idea because aldo remember was originally the first ape to say no and now aldo is here aldo is now the villain he's one of the antagonists so right. it's again a twist on what we'd expect we'd think he would be the good guy it turns out he's the bad guy same with uh Hasline in escape he was the guy that was sending out all those missions into space. You'd think he would be one of the pioneers of humanity. He would be a huge, he'd be pushing humanity forward and everything. But what is he in Escape? He becomes the villain. Right. Because of those ideals. It's so interesting that it's like, this is almost like echoes of things that we've seen in this franchise before in a lot of ways. Yes. Um, they're all kind of ideas that we've seen almost like they've been done better in other films. Because they have. Right. There's also potential to do them again better than last time here. They just don't take it. Yeah. And then and then that goes into Aldo officially taking power. He invades, he smashes open the doors to the arsenal, takes all the guns, arms all the apes, rounds up all the people, puts them in a corral, and threatens to shoot them all. And he says my favorite line in the movie. Aldo suddenly appears in front of the camera and goes, We want guns. Guns are power. <laughs> Now we go and get guns. <laughs> I'm what, like, was, what was that you were saying about this movie having weak dialogue? Adam? Yeah. I'm sorry. And, I, and um, I'm sitting there and I watch that scene and I'm laughing like, that's fun. <laughs> like, that's fun. <laughs> this is Shakespeare. So I love how the mutants, instead of doing something smart, because they have limited numbers, limited equipment, fighting well-entrenched apes, I fucking love movie logic sometimes. <laughs> Let's do a full mutant frontal assault in broad daylight with limited numbers and no cover. I go, what logic <laughs> are, are the mutants using in attacking Ape City like they do? Like, I'm sitting there and, and I'm like, as a writer, I'm like, okay, we're angry at the apes because the apes caused all this horseshit. Mm -hmm. I, okay, let's go along with that. The writer in me is like, well, we can't do a large frontal scale assault because we're all sickly mutant people. <laughs> Let's find a way to infiltrate the city at night or ape city at night. Let's find a way to flank them. Let's find a way to be creative in trying to defeat the apes here. Nah, just full frontal assault. We're fine. <laughs> it's gonna look. It's gonna look <laughs> sick. I'm just like Jesus <laughs> Christ, and I'm like, what chance do these guys have? Like, you've seen some of the wide shots. I'm like, there's only like 20 guys there in a school bus. <laughs> the school bus that should have been on the damn poster of the movie. It should have been on the poster because of the movie. when you ask people about this one, because you could ask almost all the other ones, people will remember something. Right. Right. First one. Obviously, Statue of Liberty. Right. Second one, the bomb explodes the entire yeah, world. Right. Third one, the two ape lovers. They they die. I would man. even argue the chimp going mama at the yeah. very end of the movie, a very prominent image. Fourth one, uh, that entire ending. <laughs> this one. Is that the one with the school That's bus? That's the one with the school bus. <laughs> That also leads to the other movie logic of the film is like, right, you're seeing this mutant army just kind of sitting out there in the open. Yeah. How come none of the apes noticed them? <laughs> they were looking the other way. They were, like, they were, they they were too other... wrapped up in whether or not to release the humans from the corral or not. They were thinking about other stuff. The other thing that I also noticed is why the fuck didn't Virgil just tell Caesar that he thought Aldo murdered his son? <laughs> because there's a fucking scene where, where Virgil basically says, I think I know who killed your son, Caesar. 
And Caesar's like, who, who, who? And Virgil literally goes, you'll find out in due time, I believe. Why? Why? Just fucking tell him. <laughs> like, I think that would also I be more dramatic. Be, I need to be mysterious. Wouldn't that be more dramatic, though, if, like, during the battle, right? Caesar knows Aldo has killed his son, but they have no choice but to work together for this. Right. To defend Ape City. We can kill each other later. Right. I think that would have been a way that's more incredible. dramatic. That's incredible. <laughs> that's well, that's an intelligent movie. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. What an asshole. Now, and I've said this earlier, I give them props for for the effort on the battle. The budget was just too low to create it properly. Right. And, and again, every editing book ed, ed, every editing trick in the book is used in this battle <laughs> scene to try to make it look more epic and bigger than what it really is. And I admire the effort. Yeah. It gets of an A for effort. It's just not conquest. It's <laughs> it's just not one of the best movies in the franchise. No, <laughs> it's so interesting how like the other movies. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> ends with a whimper. General Aldo with an M1928 Thompson submachine gun riding on a black horse and 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 surrounding. No, that still that still goes hard. Yes, yeah. I love that. I love it so much. I love seeing them with M1 Garands firing at everyone in this bus, slaughtering everybody inside this bus. And I'm like, this is wonderful. Still goes hard, baby. This is fun. Rewatching it, I'm like, yeah, I can see why five-year-old me was like obsessed with this movie. And, <laughs> and there's something special about that. So I will give it that. If you are a child and you watch this, it's so much fun. It, it is. It goes hard. Yeah, it's it's so much fun. It's just, you know, the problem with this movie is when you develop critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Caesar does something. He has them fall back from the barricades, uh -huh. right? And so they, the mutants puncture the city, and he sees all these dead apes. Why didn't he bother to check if any of the wounded... Well, because because I'm like, Culp goes in there, and he uh -huh. gives this like little speech about how man is is better than apes and stuff like that. And then Caesar yells, now fight like apes, which is another <laughs> line in the movie that's pretty famous. Now fight like apes. Those idiots. The, the humans are such idiots for just walking in the middle, surrounded by all these supposedly dead apes. You'd think they want to check. Or at least as they're going through them, machine gun the bodies. Right. Shoot the bodies. Right. To make sure that they're dead. So that way they don't do what they end up doing. Well, it, I mean, <laughs> that's what you see would happen in a real war. Yes. You know. Yes. And that's what you would see happen in Beneath the Planet of the Apes. I Absolutely. It, because General Ursus wasn't an idiot. Total idiot. He did think he could shoot down an atomic bomb with a machine gun. <laughs> you mentioned this really early on when we were talking about this. The scene where Aldo fights Caesar yes. on the tree. Best scene in the film, in my opinion. A absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. Caesar screaming, you murdered my son. Yep. And that's slowly well, getting angrier and angrier Because and that's angrier. character catharsis yeah. that we're finally getting. There's finally a point in this movie where something is coming to a head and there's an intelligent... Intelligent. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> conflict yes. that I actually legitimately care about. And that is why that works. Yes. And, and it does work. And the music's really creepy, too. The yep. music feels like... Th this is the only time in the film where I think the music genuinely feels like it's something from the OG Planet of the Apes. Sure. Films. It's it's weird. Yep. But it works. And I like how scared Aldo looks when Caesar gets really angry at him. Yeah. He, he's, you see him cry. This, this, a, this gorilla, who's been nothing but talk, suddenly is like, oh, shit. I, I guess I gotta... <sighs> This is my bed. I'm sleeping in it. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, okay, I like this. I like that. And I like the fact that he gets tossed off of the tree just like Cornelius did. Right. He gets tossed off a tree and dies that way. And I also like the line where McDonald, one of the humans is like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and McDonald goes, I think they just joined the human race. Which is, again, that's what apes is about. Yeah. The violence between uh, in our species against each other and how violence begets more violence. Yes. And this movie should have been about that, too. To, yes, And absolutely. so in the moments when it is about that, that's the best. Yes, that's the best. And in the director's cut, there's a, there's a scene where she's about to blow up the Alpha and Omega bomb. Mm -hmm. And Mendes says, what the fuck are you doing? That's stupid. Right. Why are you doing this? Again, hinting that things will now change. There's an understanding. And I also, I kind of like that. Yeah. Because Ape still deals with a time loop and mm -hmm. time travel. So I like the idea that things could come out different. It needs to be more than a throwaway line. Yes. Or, or a deleted scene. Correct. Because that's not in the theatrical cut at all. Right. 
so then it just focuses on the the apes in their point of view and then the movie ends with the lawgiver going full circle saying, I don't know if man and ape are destined to work together. Only time will tell. And the camera zooms in to a statue of Caesar and the statue starts crying. A controversial shot, to be sure. Because there's two interpretations to that sequence. And a shot that was originally going to be removed from the movie. Yes, everyone hated that shot. Everyone hated that scene. But I'm so glad that it wasn't removed because I think it is one of the only things in this movie for you to chew on and think about. It is, even though I think I know my interpretation of this, but there's two interpretations of the scene. One, which fits more with in line with the other Planet of the Apes movie, is Caesar's crying because it's never gonna work. The other interpretation is Caesar's crying, is weeping for joy because suddenly they're all together. And personally, I think that's that's my interpretation of the ending, knowing the theme of the film, yes. knowing knowing uh, the theme of integration in the movie, the, right. the, the, the lightheartedness of the film. And seeing the movie for what it is, I agree that that's what was intended. I would like it to be the other way. I would like it to be and the other in, way. Too. So in yeah. my head canon, it is the other thing. But that's because to me, Planet of the Apes is not optimistic. Planet of the Apes is mean. And Planet of the Apes is pessimistic and about our tendency for violence towards each other. Yes. The last note should reflect that just as the last notes have reflected that in all of the other movies. Literally all the other movies to that point, yeah. And if you're going to have an optimistic ending, you earn it with a much more complex movie than this. Yes. Which is, again, where the new movies shine. Well, that was Battle. That was Go Ape. That Two. was the, that, well, maybe we'll come back for Tim Burton in a few months. Maybe. Maybe. As of right now, we're just doing the five OG movies. <laughs> um, oh, it's been such a pleasure to go back to them. Yeah, um, it, it has for me, too, because it's been, it's been eight years, I think, since I last seen them. Yeah, I was a, I was a senior in high school yeah. um, when I watched them last time. Uh, other than apes, like original apes, mm -hmm. I've seen a few times over the years. Yeah. Um, so going back now, and especially I was only just getting into film and filmmaking when I was in high school. Um, so now as an adult, and like that's my job, that's my vocation, right. you know? And knowing what I know about how to make a movie, these are so much fun. This yeah. is so cool that you can take a budget and stretch it like this, and that you can make anything that has a legacy like this mm -hmm. coming from that mm -hmm. place. The fact that you have four very competent movies, mm -hmm. and at least you have one fun film. Sure. Because I would still well, argue I that... Well, I wouldn't say that Battle is bad. I, I, I would say it's dumb fun. Yeah. That's exactly what this is. And I think as a movie aimed towards children, it succeeded. It also like will challenge a child, it for would. sure. It would. But as a movie aimed for children, I always say this about like films like Godzilla vs. Megalon, too, yeah. where I'm like, these aren't meant for adults. These are meant for children. And the fact that they are made for kids, it succeeds tremendously. Because I, like in the case of Godzilla vs. Megalon, I was a kid, and it mm. entertained the fuck out of me. Battle for the Planet of the Apes was the same way. It entertained the living fuck out of me. Of this course. Movie. I was obsessed with these movies because of battle. It's cool that it made you a fan. Because yeah. even in, in modern day pop culture and like things that I get really into, Spider-Man specifically, yeah. there can be installments that are not for me. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's so cool that it's so versatile that people younger and generations later after me are gonna see it and take a totally different thing and say, no, that's the one that was that was for me. You see a lot of that. You see that with Godzilla all the time. Yeah. I agree, I do. I love this. I don't agree with the hate that the that the sequel movies get. So Absolutely much. not. I particularly the first three, I adore them. I I think we talked about a rating conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You have to put apes, that's the goat, right? The original. Yes. Yes. As I've said before. Objectively, I think the original Planet of the Apes movie is not just the best of the original movies. I think it will always be the best Apes movie. A hundred percent. I can totally see that. To me, it's Dawn. Yeah. But Apes, you're never going to get a more relevant outcome. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's a timeless film that will always reflect who we are as a society. Yes. I almost put that on like a pedestal on its own. Correct. And then I put the other ones in a tier list. Yes. 
and I, th I believe I've said this to you before too, the original plan of the Apes film is a classic in every way, shape, and form. A mm. genuine masterpiece and classic. Yes. The sequels are cult classics. Correct. That mentality I completely agree with. Yeah. And that's just another reason why I have a hard time putting them on the same on the they, same Well, list. they're also kind of a different sort of thing. Yeah. You know? They are. And I would say the only one that gets nearly as intelligent as that first one is Conquest. I was going to say Conquest, because Conquest subjectively, mm. kind of like with you and Beneath, right. Conquest I almost subjectively like more than the original. Correct. Kind of the I, I can totally see that. There's, And it also, it's relevant for our time and, and our... It is funny how much, how relevant it's become recently. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a movie that will generationally become more and less relevant yes. as time goes on. Yes. Because as a as a, a society, our values and what we're going through changes as yeah, well. Right. Exactly. It is interesting. Well, how would you rate these movies? I would include the original Planet of the Apes on the list since this is Go Ape and so we'll talk about all five. I have, I have two different ratings. Yeah. I've talked about how Beneath is my favorite sequel. Yes. I completely still feel that way. Yeah. It is... You can't beat that ending, man. Um, <laughs> Insane. If we're rating them on enjoyment, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to go Apes, Beneath, Conquest, Escape, Mm-hmm battle if we're rating them on merit and just what is the objectively better made film and more thought out thing mm -hmm. you have to go apes conquest beneath escape battle for me mm -hmm. personally mm -hmm. i do think conquest is so poignant it may be like i'm just troubled by the direction that it this country be. is going in it and, and but Who they're knows? flipping because cause to me to me my my order usually goes original Conquest, Escape, Beneath, mm -hmm. Battle. Yes. And to me, Escape and Beneath constantly flip-flop sure. their spot. And, and that being said, just because Escape is the second to last one doesn't mean I don't love Escape. And I, we've got I was going to say, it. you love Escape. I love Escape. Yeah. It's like Conquest has an A- minus and Escape has a B+. Plus. Right. I would say Beneath has a B plus for me, but that's because it is a B movie, man. I fucking love And Beneath. I love that about it. <laughs> I love Beneath. And it depends on what mood I Absolutely. was in. Absolutely. This most recent reviewing, that's what the order was, is the one that I just said. But had I not rewatched them and gone off of what I was thinking eight years ago, Escape and Beneath would have flipped. Sure. So it's always those two. That yeah, are constantly well, flipping be, for me. because they're both kind of the franchise in a state of flux in a way. Yeah, you know. Yeah, what are we going to do next, and what are we going to do for this? Um, and they're two totally different flavors. Totally different flavors that are indeed. still logical continuations of what's yes. going on, which is so baffling if you think about it. The fact that they work, the together. fact that any of this held together yeah. past that first movie is it's incredible. Incredible, and I think a tremendous, a tremendous effort on the team of the writers. It's, the whole thing is a testament to filmmaking being a collaboration yeah. and, and filmmaking and using what you have mm -hmm. and still trying to make something intelligent even when you're limited. It's inspiring. Absolutely. If you're a filmmaker and you watch these movies, I think it's an unbelievably um, inspiring tale of endurance. Even if you're not a filmmaker, if you're an artistic person in any sense of the word, yeah. the idea that you, you can finish the project, mm -hmm. you can make the thing, and it can still mean something. Right. You know, yeah. even even with compromise, even with changes, it can still be really poignant and really Im important. I love these movies, Oliver. I fucking love these. Movies. I love them too. <laughs> I love them too. It has been a fucking treat rewatching these movies, revisiting these movies, getting to just talk about these movies. This was very cathartic for me. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Oliver, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's been a total blast. Why don't you pimp yourself out? Um, All right. What, what you one, doing? One final time. Oliver the Ricketts, uh, you can find me. Uh, if you look up Oliver the Ricketts, I'll pop up. But you can also look up other productions and media right here on YouTube. We're doing a lot of cool stuff on there. We're talking about oddities. Um, we are, I just got adult baptized, even though I don't uh, believe in God. Um, <laughs> I'm crushing watermelons between my thighs. I'm doing a lot of social experiments um, in the form of 30-minute documentaries. Also rolling out a really cool trivia series there. You'll see it soon. You can also find me over on Designing Hollywood if you want to see me talking about movies and breaking down films. 
Um, I recently interviewed Marilyn Vance, the costume designer for Die Hard in a movie about Die Hard, which was a really big thrill for me. And again, all of those two channels that he's named, they're in the description. The links are in the description below. So make sure you do go over there and subscribe. Uh, all of my social media is also available in the description below, but this is my channel. I don't really need to pimp it out too much. So uh, in the really end, damn show. in the end, we've gone ape. We've gone ape and we're never going back. We're never going back. Sign our everybody. And then we explode. <laughs> <laughs> Countless billions of podcasts on YouTube. <laughs> Eliza Medium successful podcast.